languages just aren't my thing. But as it turns out, memorizing verb tables from an old crusty lady who's like, this is how you learn French. That wasn't my thing. And it turns out, if you think you're bad at languages, it turns out nobody learns languages by memorizing tables of your regular verbs. Jordan, thank you so much for taking the time and coming to the show. I really appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. Good to be on. So I was going through a bunch of, of our research, and I just continued to get more and more fascinating. And I really couldn't stay on track in talking about you because your life mm. is just so not on track. Like, it's like so all over the place. I was so excited about it. Not so the, on track. Okay. Not well, on, you mean, are that, not on that, track. <laughs> that's that. All of my high school teachers would agree with you that that is, that is accurate. See, please tag them. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So I know that you are insanely well known for being kind of the Larry King of podcasting. And after getting to actually listen in on a few of your podcasts, I was just so incredibly blessed that you agreed to be on the show. So thank you for that. Yeah, of course. Um, I wanted to talk about you starting a tour company, um, taking Westerners to North Korea via China. What inspired you to do that, first of all? And what, like, what were you, was it money? Was it thrill? Like, what, what made you start this? Yeah, I mean, the money's not super great in taking people to third world countries like North Korea, or authoritarian shitholes, actually, is the, 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 prop, the clinical term. Um, like North Korea. I mean, I, I really just had gone there as a tourist. And then I was like, wow, this place is super, super weird, just as I had expected. And then uh, I mentioned it to a couple friends and they were like, well, I definitely want to go if you ever go again. And I was like, why would I go again? Uh, that's such a weird thing. Why would I go again? Like, you don't, I don't go on vacation in a place over. I'm not that guy who's like, Spain was great. I want to go to the same city and the same town and stay at the same hotel every year. I don't do that. I know. I realize now a lot of people do, but anyway, it's neither here nor there. So I was like, I'm not going back. And then I talked about it on my show, the uh, the Jordan Harbinger show, or the precursor to the Jordan Harbinger show. And people were like, wow, that was so interesting. I would love to go there. Uh, let me know if you ever go again. And I was like, all right, I'm getting enough Facebook messages where people are asking me this and emails. So I just said, hey, if I were to go to North Korea again, who, who would be interested? I, I could take like 15 of you. And I think like... In 20 minutes, I had enough people before even mentioning it on the show, just in Facebook, I mentioned it. And people were like, I'm in. So I planned another trip like a few months later. And I said, hey, uh, this tour went really well. I mentioned that on the show. And then people were like, oh, I missed it. You know, I want to go. So I eventually realized I had this like bottomless pool of people that wanted to go to North Korea. And um, at the time it was legal. You know, this is Kim uh, Il, uh, Kim Jong-il. So it wasn't you know, the current leader, but it wasn't also the OG. It was like the guy in between that most of us know from Team America. And I just kept bringing tours uh, there and ha having like a special itinerary. We could engage with people in a, a very cool way that was unique. So it was a little bit thrilled, but also I thought like, hey, if we get enough North Koreans meeting Westerners, enough Westerners meeting North Koreans, we can sort of like humanize the situation yeah. and get people to pay attention to it more instead of just being like, ah, bad people over there. We got to bomb them to the Stone Age. So I decided to do that. And and then, it, of course, now it's like too dangerous and the the whole situation's off the rails. Like at the time when I was going, it was like, hey, maybe there will be some reconciliation. South Korea and North Korea were talking um, there was some idea that they might participate in international organizations and open up a little bit. And then that's kind of all gone Gosh, now. That's crazy. So do you think you'll ever go back? I can't go back with the current regime. I would have to go back if there was like a d the collapse of the regime. And then there was maybe like a U.N. or some sort of administrative zone up there, which, you know, yeah. is going to be rough if that ha happens. But I can't just go back now because, you know, they don't like journalists. They're not going to think. When I went there, I was like, I'm a tourist. Now I'm a, you know, a journalist, but I kind of always was. So are they going to be like, you right. lied about it? And then it's like, do I want to – these aren't like reasonable people where I can have somebody make a few calls and like get out of there. It's just you – know, it's a, it's a shithole. It's, a, it's an unfair authoritarian totalitarian regime. It's not, it's not any place you want to get right. stuck 
So I just basically have just, and I have kids now, right, so I'm right. like, no, you know what I mean? So, so what is the biggest misconception uh, Westerners have about North Korea? Yeah, oh God, I mean, the misconception, I would say a lot of people, they, it's hard to say because there's different misconceptions for different people. But like when I, when I talk about this, when I talk about North Korea on the Jordan Harbinger show or on other people's podcasts like this, the, there's two kinds of things that I get. There's, there's like the super, there's, there's ones on the, on the more conservative side that say things like, oh, d isn't it dangerous? And it's like, no, actually the, well, yes, the danger comes from the government. The danger doesn't come from people because all the criminals or even people thinking about being right. criminals are all dead, you know, because you, you, you quickly find that if you're a criminal in North Korea and you don't work for the government, that your whole family gets thrown into a right. to your camp and dies. So like there, there isn't that much crime against tourists there. And also you're sort of kept away from everything and you're with government minders the whole time. So you're not getting mugged because you're not even seeing anyone who's not allowed to be around you in the first place. You know, no one's even making eye contact with you, let alone like picking right. a pocket or something like that. Right. And they have no, they, they don't have internet. They don't have any way to transfer money. So even if they got, even if you were carrying a brick of cash, they could literally do nothing with it. They would have to like smuggle it over the border to China to even use it. So it's just not even useful for them. They don't have any use for your phone, you know, your computer. None of that shit even works. Right. So there, that's, that's the probably the prime misconception. The other misconception that I have that just drives me nuts is like on the on the far left sort of like ultra woke kids will be like, don't you think you're being a little judgy? Doesn't everyone have a right to govern the way that they want? I'm like, no, no, dumbass. Like you don't have a right in in under any sort of moral code or or anywhere to to throw people in concentration camps because they folded a photo of the leader. Like, no, they don't they don't really have a right to do that. Like they have a right to do it because they have a, a monopoly on violence. But they don't have a right to do that. It's I'm not being judgy by saying it's wrong to murder people who fold money the wrong way or like say, hey, we should have clean water. Those people are dead. So, no, like I, there's a, there's like a tolerance level that is so ridiculously stupid that it just makes me feel like I hope when I hear that, I just go, holy shit. Like you do you really believe that everything is relative you know, I'm not like a religious person or anything like that, but one thing that a lot of religious people will say is you need a moral authority. You can be, in my opinion, a humanist and have a moral authority that says, hey, maybe I shouldn't murder children because their parents said yeah, that incredible. they don't like the government, right? Like, I don't really, you don't, it's incredible to me that anybody could even think like, well, you're just saying that from a Western chauvinist point of view. And it's like, holy shit. Like, oh, my God. You, I don't do even know what I would do right now. You just, that. You're like, holding a right, Starbucks exactly. latte exactly. right I'm now. I'm not even sure sake. how I would react yeah. to somebody saying judgy over such moral corruption and defragmentation. Like, it's so pathetic. I don't even right. know if I'd be able to. Yeah. Yeah. It's like it's, it's like, tell me, like, did you sit there and defend the, the Taliban? Oh, they lit that woman on fire. But that's their culture. She shouldn't have yeah, gone outside with shorts on. Unreal. I mean, like, do you unreal. defend that? So when you were there, Jordan, yeah. did you, I mean, I know that you, you talked about there's not really a ton of danger, but 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 was there danger? No. Right. But did there you is, ever but feel it's not like obvious, you were in danger right? when you were there? No, no, I, I didn't really. I mean, there there's a couple of times yeah. where I should have, you know, 2020 hindsight felt danger. Like, like now I look at it and I go... So there was a kid, uh, he was an actual kid, he was 20, who, who ended up dying there Oh yeah. Um, named Otto Warmbier. He, he, not, he wasn't on one of my trips or anything, but he basically got accused of stealing a poster, and everyone who was on his trip was like, dude, we weren't even at the hotel. And there's like this blurry security camera footage of him pulling a poster down. And even if he did pull the poster down, he, he's dead as a result, so I'm not sure that we need to, like... I'm not sure how much debate there is, you know, for, for that to be a, the proper outcome there. But, like, I snuck up to that secret floor in the hotel, and I remember seeing the posters, and I remember, like, s snooping around and taking photos of sh stuff that I shouldn't have. But also, uh, w one, that's because that's what people do when things are f sort of verboten. But also, you really don't think you're going to get killed, especially because I have gotten caught doing stupid stuff in places like North Korea. Mm -hmm. And even in North Korea, and they go, hey, guys— you're not supposed to be here. But then when it, it happened to him, he died as a result because they needed a political pawn. And I'm like, oh, my God, that could have been me. Like, you just don't think about it. So I, yeah. I chalk up a lot of the the idea that I'm that I didn't get into trouble for anything as kind of like luck. 
and a different political environment that I was more aware of, but mostly probably just luck, you know, and things like that. Yeah, I remember seeing that from Otto's parents. I remember seeing all the pleas. I remember seeing all of the things that was hitting the media and them sharing pictures. I remember that whole story, and that was pretty incredible as well, especially for for a poster, like you said. Yeah, exactly. And and so, like, that that whole thing just makes me go, like, all right, these regimes are just beyond the pale horrible, right? I mean, if we caught an Iranian uh, snooping around um, and or a North Korean and they were 20 years old, I would like to think that they would be, if not totally thrown back as, okay, there's no way this person is up to no good. They would at least be treated humanely. Um, they would be able to talk to their parents. They would be fed and clothed. Yeah. Like, we're, call, again, call me a Western chauvinist, but we are just a better civilization than those, than those regimes. We're right. better than them. And we should be, and right. we should continue to be that way. So the visiting them, I wanted to engage and I wanted to like bring attention to those regimes because the way that we get them to fall is by exposing their people to ours and by getting our people to give a crap about stuff outside our borders, especially as an American. So so I'm I'm big on that, but I'm also like, oh, okay, that's probably had some close calls there that I'm not even aware of, you know? Right. And now now that you have babies, right. it was would be so much more affordable. Yeah, of you course. Like you, you don't do any like you don't do. I don't any, go skydiving or, or anything like that either, right? I don't <laughs> ride motorcycles anymore, yeah, let alone go no, to freaking exactly. Iran again. You know exactly, exactly. So so Jordan, I was reading in this, and, and I I do want to be brief about it because I I the one of my biggest pet, pet peeves on podcasts when people ask me the same question over and over and over yeah. again, I just go the content's out there. Mm-hmm. But can you talk briefly about the kidnappings? Because, I mean, the fact somebody's kidnapped once is astonishing. Mm-hmm. But to be kidnapped twice, can, yeah. you, can you share with our well, listeners like what that was all about? Sure. So, so these were both a couple years apart, like four or five years apart. The first time was a fake taxi. So it wasn't like dudes kicking in my door and being like, we're kidnapping you because you're so important. Right. It was like I was 20. I got into a fake taxi in Mexico and the guy was driving me around, and I was like, where are we going? And he's like, oh, we're going to the destination that you wanted to go to. And I'm like, no, we're not, because I live here, and you just think I don't live here, because I'm a gringo. And then I, I got into a physical conflict with him, confrontation with him. He's a 50-year-old cab, 50-something-year-old cab driver who eats tacos all day and sits and drives a cab, and I'm a, or a fake cab. And I'm a, well, it's probably a real cab when he wasn't sensing opportunity. And I was a 20-year-old who, like, ate carne asada tacos twice a day and went to the gym twice a day. You know what I mean? Like, Or I probably ate five times a day, now that I think about it, and went to the gym twice a day. So, like, the dude didn't stand a chance. And then the the second time I was in Serbia, so the former Yugoslavia, which is actually a really cool place, and I lived there for a while, but they were the police and, like, a bunch of other people were just convinced that I was a spy because there weren't really any Americans living there that weren't diplomats or working for NGOs, and I was like kind of a teacher, but I didn't really, you know, I just had friends, I was hanging out a lot. So they were just convinced that I was a spy, so their secret police service scooped me up and was like, you're a spy. And I I was 24, which I guess, like, could be a spy age, but also seems so stupid now that I think about it, because if I caught a spy and they were 24, I'd be like, you're 24, you're you're unqualified to do anything. What the hell do you know, and what are you spying on? (laughs) Yeah, for real. Like, what am I spying on? Like, I'm literally, like, waking up at 11.30 a.m. every day with a hand over from the night before right. and like eating some pasta like have you clearly your counterintelligence is bullshit or you're just making this up so jordan's like you suck you suck yeah you suck there are real spies that are doing their thing and here like you basically had to scrape me off the floor you know that at early in the morning to get me to sh- to to deal with you guys so that was that was their thing but that was just corruption i mean at the end of the day they were like looking for probably looking for a cash bribe or something right. like that. It didn't matter though because they were so freaking incompetent that we created an opportunity to escape from them and we took it. And and we saw them later and they were really cocky about having caught us, but I was like, dude, scoreboard, we escaped from you morons. Like, oh yeah, you God. got us, but we literally escaped from you and uh, like, you know, what do you it was just so stupid. It was like this dumb cat and mouse game and I remember the agents were like kind of upset about it. Um, and then their foreign minister had to write a letter of apology that didn't get to go public. It had to stay at the U.S. Embassy. And so I just read this thing in there. And I was like, this is so pathetic. Imagine, imagine like the FBI apologizing to somebody and being like, but don't tell anyone because we look like dumbasses. Right. And I was just like, this is the stupidest thing ever. I actually ended up going back to Serbia because I, I really like it. I had a lot of friends there. But 
I, I just felt bad for people that like had to live there all the time because I thought, man, to have this level of incompetence in your government, it's just in corruption was just like so dumb. And, and, you know, that kind of thing happens to Serbians too, or at least it used to with, especially under Slobodan Milosevic, who was like their former dictator. It used to happen with alarming regularity. You know, there would just be so much corruption and so much crime. And, and, you know, going back to the, the whole authoritarian government thing, like it really is bad to live in those regimes. Yeah. And it's, you're kind of lucky when you're just a tourist. Although my parents would much rather I had gone on vacation in, you know, Germany. Or I was just going to say, and your parents finally get to freaking breathe now that you have children and a wife and they're like, oh, yeah, yay, exactly. Jordan's not going to North yeah, now, Korea or Serbia. <laughs> now, now they're like, where are you going? And I'm like, Prague. And they're like, oh, thank God. You know, <laughs> they're like, finally, Phew, they, thank God. you can actually breathe. Yeah. Yeah, Berlin. Oh, okay. Look both ways before you cross the street. Thank God. Like they're just so relieved now. Yeah. And so the next thing is, is obviously you're not taking these risks anymore with that beautiful wife and that baby no. that you have. You've calm. You've calmed yeah. down. You're breathing. I have calmed down. Yeah. Um, what piece of advice do you give people that are getting ready to travel in either one of those two lo- locations that you've mentioned, or just a, a a very dangerous or or non-Westerner friendly place? What do you tell them? Yeah, I mean, the, the the big thing with going to those types of places is making sure that you are paying like, – I, I won't say paying attention to your surroundings, but like setting up backup plans, right? So instead of those people who carry their passport around everywhere because they think it's safer, you know, you, you might want to leave it with somebody that you trust. Don't leave it in a hotel safe, that kind of stuff. So there's like standard sort of security stuff. But also, you want to make damn sure that you are a little bit more situationally aware than you might be if you were on a regular vacation. So, like, if I go to Germany and and I get robbed, which could happen, okay, I'll just, like, get in an Uber or call a taxi or walk to a hotel and be like, can you take me back to this place? I have the address written on a piece of paper. In a more sketchy place, I might be like, okay, you can't necessarily trust any of the taxi drivers not to take you somewhere because you're in Afghanistan or maybe not in Afghanistan now, but like maybe you're in um, Iran or some other place. No one knows you're around. Like I, I only hire um, drivers from hotels that I stay at if I if I'm staying in mm-hmm. like the Middle mm-hmm. East, for example. I don't just like flag taxis down on the road because there's there's like a societal level of trust that is lower that you're not used to when you're a Westerner. So like if you're in Ukraine, the locals might hitchhike, but you should never do that. Um, kind of goes without saying, but also not. And also, you sh- probably shouldn't take taxis there either. So I will almost always, if I'm going to a place that's a little bit sketchy or I'm not sure, I hire a mm-hmm. fixer on the ground. And what that is is like, in, you can almost always do this. Uh, it's a whole art to figuring out who and how and where. But you definitely want a fixer. Let's say you're going to Ukraine. You want to show up and have that person pick you up from the airport. And you want to have that person make all the reservations for you. And you want to have that person sitting in the front of the car with you all the time, telling the driver where to go. He's the local that, or he or she is the local that basically is the conduit between you and everyone else. And so you're not getting ripped off. You're not getting taken for a ride literally or figuratively uh, in a way that you don't want to be. And also, if anything happens, they're like, Let me call my uncle, who's the police chief, and this will get straightened out right away. Not like, hey, remember that American guy? Haven't seen him for two weeks. Where did that guy go? And you're like in a jail cell, like, no, just let me call someone, you know? Or you're like, you're calling home and you're getting your wife's voicemail. You're lucky if you're able to make a call. Like, you want somebody. (laughs) Right, exactly. I mean, they want your money, so there's that. But like, you know, even when when I lived in Ukraine, this is a long time ago now, but when I lived in Ukraine... I remember what the best best bit of advice that I got was never get into the car with the police. Like imagine being in a country where the number one bit of advice is never go, never talk to or get in the car with the cops. That's unheard of. But if you're American and you're walking around Ukraine and someone the cop is like get in the car for a moment, right. you're like, "Well, I have to get in the car now." They will they will not they, they will not let you out of the car. You have to pay them or whatever. And, and so I remember like Ukrainian cops being like, "Get in the car." And I'd be like, "I don't understand." And and they're speaking to me in English and I'd be like, "No." And they're just like, "Get in the car." Get in the goddamn car. And I'm like, no. And they're like, Ugh, fine. <laughs> and you your know, friends are like, let's not take you. him back with us anywhere we go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. But it was just kind of, you know, funny to have those experiences where it's like cops would, or, or like getting, having a cop shove you when they're drunk and your friends are like, let's beat his ass. And I'm like, okay. Because in America, you would ne- obviously, first of all, a drunk cop was kind of unheard of. But if it were, you'd just be like, sorry, officer, I'm going to go about my way. But in, in Serbia, they're like, you know what? Yeah. Screw this guy. Let's beat this guy's ass. Or Ukraine, they'd be like, you know what? Don't touch me. And you'd have 
like a shouting match between local thugs and cops, and like the cops are getting their ass kicked, and I'm like, I really hope this doesn't <laughs> turn out poorly for me. You know, like drinking with friends and having them throw bottles at cop cars because the cops are pissing them off. It's just a different world, and you can't navigate mm-hmm. that unless, one, you live there and you get it, or two, you have a fixer. And candidly, in the best the best fixers are connected to the police say, and, the and mob. organized crime yes. in a way that is just... Right. They, they, they know yeah. how to get the authorities to leave you alone and also how to get the mafia to leave you alone. And that's like where those people thrive. Think tour guide, but also a little bit shady, so but familiar. on your side because mm. you're paying them. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. OK, that is incredibly fascinating. And I love that you've had so many travel experience. Last thing on travel. How many languages do you speak? Uh, f- like five, they? five, but they're not all they're not all created equal. Um. <laughs> English, German, Spanish, Serbo, Croatian, or Serbian, really, and wow. Mandarin Chinese. That's amazing. Yeah, well, it's amazing to me because I got C's in French all through high school, and I thought languages just aren't my Who thing. Knew? But as it turns out, memorizing verb tables from an old crusty lady who's like, "This is how you learn French." That wasn't my thing. And it turns out, if you think you're bad at languages, it turns out nobody learns languages. By memorizing tables of your regular verbs. Purely conversation. Uh, they learn it by speaking mm-hmm. it and sitting around and hearing it over and over. Yeah, like, especially now, and not that I needed to, any more proof of this, having learned it myself, but now that I have a kid, my kid knows how to talk and understand things. He He's read zero verb tables. He's read zero books right. on grammar in the English language, right? Um, so I remember, like, learning all of yeah. these complex grammatical constructions and being like, it's so hard. And then I got to Germany and I was like, oh, it's impossible. And then after a while, I was like, I can totally say things that other people are saying and understand the things that they're saying mm-hmm. just by sheer memorization. And you don't have to. In fact, it's the opposite way that we learned in school. And I, I just now that I, now when I learn languages, all I do is hire teachers and right. talk with them and do a little bit of reading. You know, and, and like my Chinese teachers are always so frustrated because they're like, you have to learn how to do the stroke order of the characters and you have to read the books on grammar. And I'm like, no. And they're, like, they're so frustrated, but they're also like, but you also have really good Chinese and other people that I've been teaching for like five years who know all the grammar. I love they how can't non-compliant say anything. It just makes so, me so happy. It makes me so happy. I am not compliant. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm not compliant. I mean, I, I, I'm not a rebel without any sort of like, I'm not just the person who says no to everything right. because, you know, screw you. Yeah. I just, I need to know the why. And if the why is because this is the way we do things, then it's like, or well, I love, that shit's or I love, not oh, happening we've for always sure. done it that way. You know, like. I'm like, and? <laughs> yeah, we've always done it that way. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, well, maybe the, so, so if, and, and look, maybe a lot of times there's a good reason for that. We've always done it that way. Okay. Why? Well, it's the most efficient way because if you do it the other way, you're going to run into all these mistakes. So if you do this first, then all of these other things will be self-correcting. But then that, then the way you've always done it is a genius way, and I should appreciate that. But if, if nobody knows why, the good ch- there's a damn good chance that you've always done it that way because it was like really easy for the teacher to hand out a worksheet and then not pay attention for three weeks. Or it weeds out the people who are going to quit when you do it that way because it starts off way too hard. Or um, if you do it this way, then you'll be really good at this structure or this other skill that nobody uses anymore because we have computers. So we don't need to do that anymore. And it's it's like um, we've always taught long division. Okay, but I've never had to do long division by hand in the history other than school in the history of math. So there's no reason for me to to learn it that way anymore. Um, Cursive writing was another one. I was like, why is it this way? And now that I'm an adult, the once a year when I have to fricking write something by hand, I print because it's more legible and and it's better. (laughs) And so it's like when, when, um, and people know what I'm saying. Yeah. So, so I, I told my mom, um, I go, I'm not going to teach my kid cursive, you know, and and if the teacher's like making him learn that. And my mom posted this thing on Facebook that was like, like, I, you know, I've heard that they're not teaching cursive anymore. And all these adults were like, I can't, you know, boomers were like, I can't believe it. This is terrible. It's a downfall of society. And I I wrote, how fast is all y'all's typing? Because I've seen you guys type. How often do you handwrite versus type? How often do you think people who are under 70 handwrite versus type? And they were like, like, a couple people were like, okay, I get it, you know, (laughs) because. I yeah, everybody's it. like, who's this so, little shit? So, Jordan, you went to law school, and then 
decided you were going to become an attorney and then got laid off in one of the mm-hmm. world's worst downturns in 2007, major yeah. financial crisis. Um, what yeah. happened? Yeah, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. So I went to law school, never wanted to be a lawyer, but was like, I can't get a job. Um, a good job anyway. And so I applied to law schools and I applied to a bunch of grad schools and I got into a bunch. And then um, a, fr- a lot of people were like, you have to go to Michigan because it's like the best law school that you've applied to besides Harvard, which you're not getting into. And I was like, fair. <laughs> so I got into Michigan and they're like, well, now you have to go there because you you'd be wasting this really good golden ticket opportunity where you can get like any job you want in the legal field if you go to Michigan. And, you know, your starting job will be like 150 grand a year straight out of school and blah, blah, blah. So I was like, great. So then I just studied my ass off at Michigan, got a job on Wall Street, uh, did the job, you know, like any first or second year associate would. And then they were like, hey, we don't have any work for you anymore, dot, 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 massive economic downturn 2008. And they laid off the whole class. I mean, they, they didn't officially lay us off. They just said, hey, we'll pay you for a year you should find another job. And I was like, I'll just take the year salary and bounce. So they weren't like, you specifically suck. It was just kind of like the whole firm is probably going under. And if you find another job, great. But if you don't, we'll pay you for the whole year. And I was like, I'll just take the money and just not find another job. And they were like, cool, you're crazy. And that's when I started the Jordan Harbinger, or the the coaching business that I ran and then the precursor to the Jordan Harbinger show. I basically used this Wall Street money as like seed capital for my business slash, you know, buffer my salary. Because when you're doing a startup, you're making like no yes. money. And when you're young, that's great. But $24,000 in Manhattan sucks. That's <laughs> you a know, month. so that's, you got your yeah, month on salary. Yeah. <laughs> that was my annual like sort of take. And I was like, okay, I'm in trouble. So, so having that sort of buffer from some rich Wall Street law firm was fantastic. So that was, that was really good for me. Um, and very lucky. So it was the best thing that ever happened to me because I got this awesome job. It brought me out to a big city. I had a, a bunch of experience in that city, made a bunch of friends, and then was able to start a side hustle and then get things off the ground. And then as soon as my side hustle started getting off the ground, they were like, oh, you don't have to show up anymore, but also here's all this money. And I was like, this is like the best timing. And I was too young and inexperienced to even know what an economic downturn right. meant, a recession meant. So... I just pretended like it didn't exist. So I learned how to sell and start a business and hire and do this and do that all during a recession. And I remember talking to my accountant probably in like 2009 or 2010, maybe something like that, 2009. And I was like, yeah, it's just really hard. I don't know what we're going to do. It's really hard to scale. And he goes, you made like $700,000 in a recession in a new business. I've never seen anyone do that before he's like where i'm working for like main major real businesses they're not making this and you guys are like just stumbling in the dark figuring out how to sell and figuring out how to like hire and you're we hired like all these idiot kids who we thought would work as hard as us and didn't and we're like dumb as rocks and and our, like our friends Weird. basically I'm hearing that so 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 often. yeah yeah like, like these kids are just not working and so incredibly entitled yeah yeah there's a lot of that i mean it was like all of our yeah. friends i was like oh well let's just hire all of our friends because they're good people yeah. and they'll, they'll get it and then you'd hire them and i'd be like dude it's 2 30 p.m have you done this and this and this and they're like ah oh, drank last night till 7 a.m i'm like it's tuesday dude what are you doing <laughs> So Here, I'll slow it down, slow it down. Yeah, slow it down. So so I got rid of a lot of those people, but that was like our accountant and our business manager who were adults. They were like, guys, you're surrounded by losers. Knock it off. You made a bunch of money in a recession. This is actually really good. I know it feels hard, but like you're making it harder on yourselves. So that was when we were like, let's just fire everyone and do things ourselves and like learn all these skill sets that we thought we couldn't learn. Like we'd hire salespeople and they'd work like half an hour a day and give us the runaround. And I was like, okay, you're fired. I'm learning how to sell. You know, it was like that. And that that was really good because one, I built all these skill sets. And two, now that I have to manage people who do that. I'm like, it's not that hard. And what are yeah. you doing right now? Oh, I'm doing something, something, lead generation. I'm like, show me, because I've done this for years. Oh, you're right. screwing around on fucking Instagram? You're fired. You know, like, that part of my Latin. Oh, but like, I, I literally I wish you were here, because I would grab your face, and I would kiss your entire face mm. off. 
Like it's the conversation that I have that I'm like, okay, maybe I'm the one. Maybe yeah. I'm making it difficult because I had to sell as a, as a brand new mom, as a single mom, never yeah. having a sales skill set with, with, a, with, with Hoover's, Jordan, with Hoover's Ugh. list. You know, like with going in and going list building when list building was on spreadsheets and right. I, and, and you had, you had to do this much and you had to, you know, what was your output? What was your input? What was your, I had to do all that. So now when people go, oh, I'm selling, I'm like, oh, walk me through how. And then their mm-hmm. whole face just drains out. Like, well, Instagram has got this new app that's got this new Explorer page that's got this. I'm like, stop. I can't do it. Yeah, I just can't stop. stop. Stop talking. Yeah. They're thinking like, oh, I run ads and then people enter their email and phone number and then I call them and then, or like I email them a f- payment sheet. I'm like, people don't really know how to sell anymore or they could they, they know how to like write tricky sales copy and send paid traffic to it, which is fine. There's a place for that, but- Really, like a real sales skill set is a is a difficult to obtain only through hard won reps like personal skill set that is so valuable and people don't really want to do it because it involves getting rejected like a million times and and you have to learn so much about it and you only get paid. It's also like the lazy person's worst nightmare. It's and it. It's actually a lot of people's worst nightmare because you only get paid for what you sell. It's like commission based. And, you know, when I hire salespeople now, they're like, how about this for a base and this for a commission? I'm like, how about no base and just commission? And they're like, whoa, I can't do that. And I'm like, you you can't or you don't want to or you need to get paid even if you don't perform. Because all I hear is you don't you don't want to you, you want to get paid even if you don't perform. And so the sales commission structure that I was on in my own business with my own business partners was you only get paid commission period. And so I think my, they were like going to cover my rent. So I wasn't homeless basically. And like my phone bill. So for like six months, I made 800 bucks a month that all went to my rent and phone and like maybe some food. And then it was like, from there, I started making a ton of money. And, and the initial disagreement I started to have with my business partners is after two years, they were like, yeah, it's not fair that you make $600,000 a year when we make 200. And I was like, it's actually way more than fair. Because I'm bringing in all the money because you guys, you didn't complain when I made $800 a month. Like there was no, you guys were pretty damn quiet. So that was the beginning. And I was like, I, you know, that was when I was like, hey, I actually have all the skills here and I have all the cards and I have all the leverage. And that was like the beginning. That's incredible. So I, I, so, so no regrets for leaving law. No, 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 of course not. No, I was never really interested in it. Your parents again are having another stroke. Like it's the second stroke, the second. Yeah. They didn't even care. They were just like, become a functional member of society. And then, of course, but after leaving law, they were like, so you were making this and now you're making like this and you're deferring your student loans. And then it was like, well, I paid off a bunch of my student loans while I was at the law firm so that I could have like this runway, which turned out to be really smart. So a lot of people deferred their loans. I was like, I'm going to pay $12,000 a month towards my loans instead of 1000 So like every month it was like I paid off like a year. So when I deferred them for two years, I wasn't losing all of that money, I was just sort of catching up. And then right. after a while, I was able to pay off my loans early, of course. Um, but my parents are like, my parents are like white knuckle flight. Like incredible. they're just like, oh, that's our kid. You know, and it really could have gone both ways with me for sure. No. So do you have siblings? Yeah. So you're the only child? I know. They oh, were like, God, they were Jordan. Like, oh, God. Yeah, that's what my parents are saying. Like, oh, my God. Plus, I, it's sort of good, though, because if I did, they might be like, so your sister is a teacher and she's like yeah, this, you know, and you're ask. like, exactly. like, they would have been like, no, but since I didn't have any, they were like, we know our kids weird compared to our friends, kids, but we don't really know like, is that our fault? Like, is it the environment? So they were just like, uh, okay. You know, now they're stoked though. They're like, they're like, you, br- you created your own path. And I'm like, yeah, I guess I kind of did Not not because I'm like a genius, but because I just was unemployable and hyperactive and couldn't focus. <laughs> I think that's fabulous. So, so what, what was your main objective for starting the podcast? Uh, like, what did you do? Like, yeah, why did you originally I wanted to, I was teaching a course and so I was trying to record my lectures. I put that in loose terms cause they were not lectures. But, like, I wanted to record it because people would show up. It was an elective, so people would start, like, whenever. And it became, like, this informal class. And so I wanted people to listen to the background information. And if they'd showed up, like, three weeks in, I'd be like, you have to listen to this. So I started recording that, and I was handing out CDs. And then it was, like, this fun thing that we were doing 
where I was recording these, and I was like, I really like the recording of it more in the talk, the teaching, more than I like the other element of of the coaching and all this other stuff. So, my friend and I, who was running this course with me, who later became my business partner, we were like, we need to figure out how to get people to get MP3 files on the internet, and there was like no way to do that. So then they they came up with this new thing called podcasting in like 2006. And he's like, you can put this website and then people can download it. And if they have iTunes, they can grab all the files and yada, yada, yada. So we set that up and we thought like, okay, people in Ann Arbor, Michigan, they will download these files and then we'll be able and we'll get like 20 people and we'll have a full class and we can start raising the price for the class. But then we started seeing people from like South Africa and Germany and Canada downloading it. And we're like, how do these people know about this? You know, and they must be finding it somehow. So we started to say on our, at that point, our show, because we started treating it like a show, we're like, hey, if you're listening to this and you don't live in Ann Arbor, Michigan, like, how did you find this? Who are you? So we started getting emails from all over the world and people were like, oh, I was searching for like dating skills or networking skills or like this thing and your show came up and it's like really cool. It was like this sort of two dudes in a basement chatting, which is what a lot of podcasts still are. But back then there just wasn't that. Yeah. So we had a lot of women listening and we had a lot of men listening and we just started to get like this cool viral following as much as viral. This is before YouTube even existed, just sort of to put a timestamp yeah. on it. So like all these guys and gals who were listening were like, wow, this is like a secret club that I'm in that I listen to this. And that was fun. You know, it was like a really cool way to reach people across. And we had all these friendships with people in different countries because of it. I mean, this is early, early internet. Like the way people communicated online at that point was like AOL instant messenger. And then there was podcasting MySpace. and then there was MySpace. That was it. You know, that was really it. Friendster maybe even back then. So, so how many episodes have you recorded? Of the Jordan Harbinger show, I'm probably on like 500 something. But before this, I had 700 on my other show. So it's, you know, 1200 plus episodes altogether that I've done. What's the biggest mistake that you've ever made mm. on podcasting? Yeah, yeah, on yeah. On podcasting. <laughs> I'm like, hang on, let me yeah, jump yeah. in and say let podcasting me, yeah, first. Yeah, frame it, right. <laughs> I, honestly, I should have split from my former, I, every business that I've left, I should, with partners and whatnot, I should have left like a long time before. And I think that's true with like most relationships, you know, like your friends were divorced. You're like, yeah. when did you know it was over? And they're like, ah, 2015. And you're like, dude, it's 2018. And you're still like, you're just now thinking about divorcing. And that, like, the, it's always 2020 hindsight. Oh, this went to shit like way earlier than I thought. And so when I look at all these things that these reasons that I stayed in bad business partnerships or put up with too much crap, it was almost always not the like the reason would be oh well you know they do this and they do that and they do this and i was like you know the real reason was that i was kind of scared that i couldn't do it on my own or i was scared to like make the leap and people stay in bad I love jobs that you, said that. You, you know what i mean like people stay in bad jobs yeah. they stay in bad relationships with a bad partner business is no different it's really no right. different like you think like oh i can't do the sales by myself and then you learn to sell and you're like why the f hell did i wait so long to learn this or you're like oh i can't do this thing by myself i don't want to be alone and then you're alone and you're single and you meet someone who's amazing and you're like why did i put up with that person's shit for so long Ugh. so long yeah and it, and it actually changes who you are chemically like you start changing who you are in that sure. relationship whether it be a business or whether it be personal whatever it is and then you miss out on all the amazing opportunities that could be coming your way exactly yeah and it, but it is and i get it it's fear but it's also like I mean, that's the cruel irony is like you feel you're like, what's that phrase? The good is the enemy of the perfect or perfect is yep. the enemy. Of the, something like that. Basically, like if you're in something, and you're like, ah, I'm never going to meet anyone like her. So I might as well put up with all of her horrible things like her <laughs> belittling me all the time or like crashing my car. And then you finally break up it with that like person. It was awfully personal. That was no, that's a that's a <laughs> that's a common one. Everybody has that. Right. Right. OK. Yes, um, yeah. For no, sure. but like but like, you know, you put up with this person's crap or like you're like, oh, my boss is crap. And you like steals my pay but all buses do that right and you're like no they no. totally don't do that no they don't and then the person leaves and thinks they're never gonna get another job again and they're like oh my new boss is really cool and like everyone here is great why did I stay so long with this horrible thing and it's always like 
there's like the the new job and then there's or the new thing and then there's the experience and then it starts to to degrade and like you should leave at this point in the graph right. but you like keep going until the graph is like all the way down Absolutely. here and you're miserable and you're like in a therapy session and your therapist is like you definitely need to quit your job or you definitely like, need to no, break but, up with this person but... no you don't understand and then she's like yeah 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 quit your freaking job and then you do and you're like uh my life's over and then 2 weeks later you're like Think I'm cured. Yeah, don't exactly. need therapy anymore. You're like, feeling pretty I'm, good about I've lost life. Lost twenty pounds, and you're like, yeah. and I'm like having so much fun. Yeah, exactly. So exactly. So Jordan, when you go into the studio to record a podcast, I mean, you're pretty high energy. I've watched a lot of your stuff. Is there ever days where you're just really not feeling it? And if if there are days like that, what mm-hmm. do you usually do before you get there or while you're while you're in transition? To it. Yeah, there, there's stuff like that. I mean, I, I feel like days like that, you know, jet lag type days yeah. or or whatever, those happen. Um, first, first things first, you know, get some coffee in you. If that doesn't help, you know, maybe go for a walk, get some sunlight, or or both at the same time. But if I'm really not feeling it, I often it depends what it is. If it's something I can move, like a show, then I'll move it because. At the end of the day, you have to be able to perform right. well. And if you're like, oh, I have a cold and like, uh, you know, my knee's bleeding from a fall, I don't want to be distracted by all that crap. But if it's something that I can't do, you know, physical activity is always good. Getting yourself into that positive emotional state through sunlight is always good. I mean, it sounds like basic and it, it really is. But I also try and think of like, I, I try and make everything seem fun. Like, oh, this is going to be a fun conversation, even though it's five o'clock in the morning and I should never have booked this. You know, I'm like, oh, it'll be great. It'll be. So I try and reframe it. But really, at the end of the day, I kind of feel like I can sort of borrow from future energy and pack it into a half hour if I have to. But that's probably just practice. Right. Like, all right, I'm going to give this talk, even though I'm hungover and feel disgusting. And then you do it and you're like, okay. And then you go, you know, you go back to sleep. Um, The other thing is you have to manage your energy really well. Like now that I'm 41 it's not the same thing as when I was 31. Like 31 is like drink a little bit too much, get up, go to the gym, have a day anyway. 41 is like, I drank too much four days ago. I can't do this. <laughs> so you, you know, the answer is stop doing like, stupid stop crap like that. Like stop <laughs> staying up late, stop drinking, stop staying up late, stop eating pizza three days in a row. Like you're an adult now, you know, you can't do that anymore. And, and that's been helpful because I noticed a lot of my friends who were like, oh, I'm feeling like as I get older, I'm just slowing down. I'll hang out with them, and I'm like, you had fries for lunch and chips for breakfast? Like, this is part of the problem, dude. You're like, you're a disaster. You know, or like you're eating sugar because <laughs> yeah, exactly. you're a disaster. Get your shit together. Do you yeah, say there's it? a lot of that. Do you of say that. it, there's Jordan? Like do you say it? Get it together, dude. Okay. Yeah. I'm not shocked yeah, by yeah, that yeah, at yeah. all. I just wanted yeah. to make sure I was right. Mm. Um, who's your – okay, you, I, you seem super open. I'm going to ask. You don't have to answer, but I think you will. Worst guest sure. ever. Ooh, worst guest ever. It's not going to be somebody famous, probably. Let me think. You know, it's never anybody famous. Like, I'm trying to, I'm trying to think now, like, it's funny because you'll talk to, like, Mm -hmm. Howie Mandel and you're like, this guy's so nice and spent all this time and is, like, so generous and cool and fun. And then you get some, like, YouTube TikToker on there and they're such a prick and you're like, who the hell do you think you are? And all of it comes down yeah. to people's insecurities, so I try to remember that. I'm like, oh, this is a person yeah. who's peaking right now, and they like they know it, and they're being used by other people, and they know that they they like have master imp- exactly. massive imposter syndrome. They know what they're doing is a commodity. They're never going to have this as their long term career. So I try and I actually yes. end up feeling sorry for those people. But usually, when the interview is over, I'm like, or, or whatever we're doing, whenever it's over, I'm like, fuck that guy. This person is terrible. Right? Like, You're I like, hate upload this. Upload quick. But upload I quick. I will upload definitely. <laughs> I'm like, ah, delete. Uh, yeah, I'm like, delete, whatever. I mean, I, I'll trash no, stuff like that. Sure. I'm not going to subject my audience to that crap. Um, but I, I have noticed that, like, the the getting Mark Cuban on, easy, cool, fun. Getting somebody who has a viral video about some crap and, like, does pranks on TikTok. I mean, I don't get those people anymore. But, like, yeah. you know, they're just the worst. And talking to my friends and I, I used to live in Hollywood and a lot of my friends are like agents yeah. and stuff because it's a lawyer job right and they're like I, I asked them I go what do you think like am I just lucky with this or unlucky with this and they'll go no 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 the coolest people it's like Tom Cruise is really nice or whatever but the worst people are like D-list stars yes. from non-US yes. markets and it's like someone some dude comes in from like 
I don't even know. I don't want to like shame a country, but like, you know, South America or like India and is like a total prick and treats everyone like shit. And it's like, dude, you are no one here, man. Nobody cares about your shit here at all. So much because actually I'm going to take this entire clip and I'm going to put it on my 11 year olds like, you know, his his little transformer thing that he listens to the stuff on because those kids, those TikTokers and those influencers. And I'm not I'm not saying all of them because there's some of them that are really, really great. But I'm just saying those ones that are peaking, I, I too feel the same way. I'm like, I, I feel sorry for them. They have everybody's hand is out. They don't know who to trust. They mm-hmm. don't really truly know what an influencer really is because it's an influencer in this big of a market. So I think mm-hmm. you completely nailed it that right. come in, be humble. You can state your opinion and you can be whoever you are, but do it with like, you know, grace and tenacity and, and be a constant and curious student. And these younger ones are really kind of not overly amazing at doing that. They're not. No, it's it's funny because I'll meet these young kids that are like 16 and they have millions of followers yeah. and they are so depressed. Some of them are really nice. They're not all like entitled pricks. Some of them are really nice and they're just so depressed because everyone's using them. They're a target. They're being bullied online constantly by total strangers. They're in. You think like, oh, it must be so nice. Like all the, the, the literally I remember one one little girl honestly she's probably i think she's like 14 or 15. she was doing this live broadcast and she's like i'm outside my house just like walking to the mailbox i want to see if i got anything cool because i ordered something and i I was like this is so stupid this person needs to learn how to like run and you know this person's an influencer like she needs to take lessons and i was like wait what is that number in the lower left hand corner and they're like that's the number of people watching this right now and it's like thirty-eight thousand people are watching her walk to her mailbox to see if she got something. This is insane. How is this possible? Like, this, I can't even, The Rock could walk to his mailbox and people would be like, I'm not gonna watch you walk to your mailbox. This little girl who's 14 lives in Minnesota is like, I'm walking to my mailbox, everybody. And it's like, oh my God, I gotta tune in right now. Um, That's too much much pressure. pressure. It's so in much the com- pressure. You're, you nailed the it. Comments the are other horrible. Thing is Jordan. And, yeah. And I know your kids aren't old enough. I have four, and they're like eleven to twenty six. They haven't even learned the face to face kind of, you know, the pressure face to face, the pressure, yeah. that kind of like really robust, um, it fitting in and influencing, and every, and then everybody's just shredding them online. They go back into their home, and they must be just so devastated. But again, bills to pay, and so many people are counting on this little one to actually yeah. produce. Yep. It's horrible, and it's too much. It's it's not a good environment because uh, I I've seen I, I'm friends mm-hmm. with a manager for some of these like major kid influencer type people, and he's like 24, and he's the adult in the room, and I'm laughing at him because I go, dude, you don't even know how to like put gas like, in your gas, car. Are you kidding electric. me? Like you're, ba- I mean, barely, right? Yeah, it it is an ele- he has an electric car, but I mean, it's it's which is funny, but like he is right, kind of exactly. when I look at him, I see like a a kid. He's 24. But when he's looking at these guys and these gals that he's working with, they're so young that he'll walk into this house that he manages with them. And he's like, hey, what's going on? And they'll be like, hey, we're really hungry. And he's like, you made $13 million last year collectively. Yeah. You don't order freaking DoorDash? What's wrong with you people? And they're like, I don't yeah. know. I just yeah, was lazy. That's... Like, they don't know how. They do, but they don't. Like they there don't know how. They're like, that, they're Jordan. kids. They're children. Like, let's think about that. Well, like, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Like just automatically deliver food to these. But everyone's trying to take advantage of these kids and like they'll they yeah. they don't know what's going on. They'll do something and they'll get a sexual assault allegation because they did something horrible. But like yeah. they weren't thinking about it it's at the over. time and someone else goaded them into it. Now their career's yep. kind of over. And, and a lot of them have shit parents, too. Right. Like their their parents, you know, maybe they have a single parent and that person makes thirty five thousand dollars a year. So when their kids making thirty five thousand dollars a month or twice that they're not like, oh, right. it's okay. Just go back to being it's a regular so kid. They're like, nah, fix it. Are you kidding? You know, like I, I've got a daddy got a Mustang on the way. Don't quit this job. And they're like, oh, it's making me miserable. And I'm filming myself doing degrading things. Yeah, and they're exactly. Like, exactly. Oh, it's fine. Who's your best guest? I want who, a boat. Who is the one that you had the most chemistry with or you would say is your, is your most favorite guest? 
Ooh, hard to say. I have so many good ones. I mean, like Ray Dalio is really cool all the time. Uh, Howie Mandel was really cool. T Pain was really cool. Danny Trejo is really cool. Matthew McConaughey is cool. Malcolm Gladwell is cool. Like I, I don't know. I have a lot of really good ones. The, the ones that I think are, I'm obviously having my friends on the show who are like scientists. Those are always sort of really fun and easy and chill. But, you know, having some of these big names on, it's always really kind of easy. Like, ha having a big name guest is actually quite easy once you get over the stress because they're so nice and they're good at it. You don't have to drag the information out of them. They're good at presenting it. That's always really fun. And especially when um, they're talking about something that they really want to talk about, which yeah, is Yeah, that they want to talk about. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Who, um, it, yeah, dream podcast, dream good. podcast guest. Ooh, dream podcast guest. It's really hard to say. I used to think, I used to be like, oh, Will Smith would be so good. And like, don't get me wrong, he would be good. But there's a lot of, I probably shouldn't use, I'll, I'll give you a, an example without a name. Whenever I think someone's going to be really awesome and then they come on, I'm always like, oh, that was it. Partially because you build them up in your head, but also partially because a lot of like the super celebrity people are so yeah. fake that it's just not fun. You're not having a real conversation. There's three publicists in the room and they're all like trying yeah. to do hand signals to you. And it's annoying as hell. And like th they were going to do an hour, but now they're doing 45, but they're already 15 minutes late. And then when they get there, their publicist is like, he has to leave early. And you're like, dude, what yeah. the hell? You know, like that stuff is way more stressful. I would say... You know, it's it's really hard. I don't have anybody where I'm like, oh, that person would be so amazing. I'm working towards it. You know, I it's it guest booking is so hard that it's just it's like not worth it. <laughs> like you just get your hopes up for nothing. Exactly. So I sort of take so it in stride at this point. Who is would Barack Obama okay. would be yeah, good? That's How's that? That's great. Yeah. As long as you can. The, the trick is always, can they tell the truth or is it going to be some polished shit? And like, that's the that's the question. Like. Yeah, it would be really cool to talk with uh, Vladimir Putin, but exactly. he's not going to tell me anything real. So it's not. So that's be one that, of the biggest good. things that I've been ha right? having to train. Okay, not not be. I mean, being very very new to podcasting, but having to train people, and I don't want people to come in and just talk about everything else that they've talked about. And the problem is, is that right. a lot of people are under extremely strict NDAs. A lot of people, especially in the crisis stuff, like a lot of the athletes and celebrities, their attorneys are with them. So they're not going to answer. They're going to say that they can't comment. Like, I, I don't right. have any desire to do that. I don't want just a name on the show. Like, I want somebody who's going to add value in real content. So that's the constant balancing act on, can you can you talk about everything? Can you talk about anything? Like, what do you want to talk about? Mm -hmm. So I'm actually really glad that you said that as well. Yeah, it's... <laughs> that's like that same question. Oh, you can have dinner with somebody who was, who would it be? It's like, Oh, I'd love to go to dinner with Warren Buffett. He's not going to tell no. you what stocks to buy, dude. He's just going to like small talk you and then exactly. leave and pick up the check. <laughs> yeah. Right. If you're lucky, right. That's it. So I, I rarely do. I kind of like go for that stuff. It, I think a lot of podcasters and uh, social media people, they go for these big names, but they don't care about what that person has to say. Yeah. They just want to take photos next to them and be like, so fun hanging out with my boy Will Smith on Inst and then post it on Instagram. It's like it's clout chasing bullshit. It doesn't. They're not building. Yes, they're not exactly. making anything. Who's, you know, whose whose show would you love to be a guest on? Mm, let's see. I mean, just for purely business reasons, Joe Rogan would be great because it's just yeah. like massive free advertising, yeah. right? Um, Doctor Phil would be interesting. You know that kind of thing. Uh, as long as you're not like the subject right? of his ire, you know, <laughs> not that I admire uh, all of these things that these guys do, but like just from a business perspective, it'd be great. A lot of fun to, to, rip to with go those on guys, those shows, sure. you know, like, yeah, to totally. Or like Oprah and have Oprah be like, you're so entertaining and smart. I should have done this years ago. And you're just like, yes, yes, you should have. And then I'm like, hi, mom. Like that stuff. It's sort of idle. It's sort of just like that. idle. What's the hardest piece of advice that you wish you'd followed earlier? Ooh, I I think a lot of people told me to go at, go it on my own early, and I but I didn't have the confidence to do it. I was like, oh, I need my business partners. I need my team, uh, you know, with me. And I have my team with me now, and they're amazing. But like my business partners, like I look back now and I go, ah, leeches that I was like attaching to myself over and over again, just absolute leeches. And now that I've left. 
like, and you don't realize it until you're gone, right? Because now that I've left and I've done my own thing for several years now, I look back and I go, well, what are they doing? Let's see what they're doing. Oh, nothing. And that sort of proves like, maybe those people were right that I was bringing all of the content yeah. or the business or the whatever, like, you, and the revenue, and the Jordan, revenue, the right? Because you think yeah. like when people go, "You're the reason this thing exists." You're like, "All right, I don't want to be egotistical. I don't right. want to go Axel Rose on everybody and just like ruin it." Um, so I'm not going to let that go to my head. But, but then now I'm like, "Oh, they were they weren't just being nice saying that. Like, there's the business is not doing shit without me, and I know why." And, and it's but you really you have to test yourself to see what you're gonna what's gonna happen. Like when I separated from my my last business, I was like, oh, it's going to take me like five years to get back up to snuff. I spent 11 years building that business. Is it even possible? Within like a year, it was like, oh, we're at the same level as they were. And then within three years, I was like, I'm five times larger now yeah. than I was with, it, with them. How is that possible? It, oh, they were dead weight the whole time. Like yeah. plot twist, right? And it's, it's so hard, though, because then you look back on it and, and because obviously, Jordan, because you're such a good person and you look you look back on it and you're like, what was so for me? I go, what was wrong with me that I couldn't see yeah. what everyone else was yeah, seeing it's com- and confidence saying? issues? Yeah, 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 exactly. For sure. For sure. Um, what's the best piece of advice that you could give a brand new podcaster? I mean, it's it's all about creating great content for your audience, you know, like the 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 viral appeal of podcasting is nil. Advertising is great, but the best thing you can do is create really sticky stuff. So people listen to something and they go, that was good. Let me get more. Because if you're just having people spread by word of mouth, that's great. But if you're having people spread by word of mouth and then they're like, you have to catch every episode of the show because it's amazing. That's when you start getting this snowball effect, right? Like, and, and that's, what's great about podcasting is People really love their favorite creators, but with like YouTube, I, I routinely watch things on YouTube and I just let it play and then that's it. You know, I'm not like subscribing yeah. to everything. I'm watching one-off videos on creators. But with podcasting, if you get me into one and it's good, I'm like, I've got to download all of these and listen to all of them and go back and da da And so podcast listeners are really, really sort of loyal. But the the bar for good content is higher. Right. You know, like, it, it, you really have to do something. You have to create good audio. You can't waste their time. You can't be cramming your mentorship stuff down their throat every five minutes you can't be like and i'll tell you the real secret if you join my inner circle like you can't do that every single time and a lot of these people try to do that and and i've noticed that like all these guys that try and milk their audience they just don't last that long um or they churn a lot right they'll be like oh i used to listen to this person but i just got sick of their crap well, you just don't you don't you want, don't want you don't that want it. it's like going when you're doing a podcast when you're listening you're listening to people co- conversate you don't want to get sold every mm. you know however long it's every, just ridiculous yeah. it's like for exactly what? yeah exactly and a lot of these sort of like guru dudes are doing that so my last question and i would love 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 mm. to have you back because this was so much fun who's your mm. favorite podcaster Ooh, it's tricky. I, I really like pr- Scott Galloway. I don't know if you know I who don't. that is. Um, he is a teacher at NYU Stern School of Business, and he does a show called Pivot with Kara Swisher, who's a journalist. And they both they have their show. They, I, I mean, it's hard to pick like it and be like that's my favorite show, but it's great because they talk about business trends and tech. It's kind of a little bit niche, but it's a big show and it's really, really fun to listen to, but I don't listen to like general interviews from people or anything like that. I just don't really do that anymore. Um, and I'm not into the self help stuff anymore. So I, I kind of like find myself gravitating towards all these different places, uh, with it. But yeah, I, I like those, I like those guys, Scott Galloway and Kara Swisher, I would say are two of my top right now. That's awesome. So, I want to thank you so, so much for coming on the show. And I really appreciate how generous you are with your time. How do listeners for sure. find you? Yeah. Just check out the Jordan Harbinger show anywhere you find your podcast. That's all I want. I don't, you know, I don't have anything for sale. I'm also at Jordan Harbinger on Twitter and Instagram. But yeah, just the podcast. Look, if this was remotely entertaining and you'd like to hear me interview other people, check out the Jordan Harbinger show. Thank you so much, Jordan, for being on the show. You got it. Thank you.